Well, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Mark Minton, the uh, president of the CREA Society, and I want to welcome you all to tonight's program. Uh, this is a very special program, and I'm personally delighted, uh, uh, not only because we're able to welcome back uh, for the second time in a few years uh, Blaine Harden, uh, who is the author of this wonderful book that we're going to discuss tonight. Of course, uh, many of you may know Blaine uh, from his previous book, which was a, a worldwide bestseller. I believe it was translated into 27 languages or something like that, uh, Escape from Camp 14. Uh, and uh, uh, that has been on everyone's uh, a list of one of the best books of uh, last year or the year before in the area of foreign affairs. Uh, I must uh, admit that I'm astonished that so soon he has a second book and a second book about Korea. And it's, uh, it's a, a wonderful uh, tapestry of uh, two lives that intersect and then part uh, that uh, fabulous adventure story, but it actually uh, is a lot, uh, has a lot in it about the history of the Korean uh, Peninsula. I, I've read many books about uh, uh, Korean history after 1945, but I learn, I'm learning something from his book right now. Uh, Blaine, uh, someone I've known for 30 years, uh, has had a very distinguished uh, career as a reporter uh, for the Washington Post for many years. He's been a reporter for The New Yorker. Uh, he's written several books on, on more subjects than most people know anything about. And his last two books, as I said, have been about uh, events in Korea. Um, our special guest tonight is Mr. Kenneth Rowe. Uh, who is uh, one of the main characters, along with Kim Il-sung, in uh, the book uh, that we are discussing tonight. Uh, and uh, I'll let our guest explain how the lives intersect, but let it just be said that uh, Mr. Rowe uh, is uh, the uh, hero, actually, who uh, flew his MiG uh, from North Korea at the end of the Korean War uh, to Seoul's Kempo Airport, Defected and provided uh, the UN command with its first close-in look of at a, a fantastic fighter plane. Uh, subsequently, he came to the United States and, uh, for the last half century, uh, has uh, lived in the United States and has had a very, very successful career in aeronautical engineering. Uh, we're delighted uh, to have these guests tonight, and uh, I would like to invite Blaine to. Uh, uh, begin his discussion with Mr. Rowe. Thank you for coming. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I have some questions uh, for our leader. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is just sort of give a sense of why I wrote this book. And then I'm going to ask Ken some questions about how he managed to do the amazing thing that he did. Um, let's see. Um, ah, here we are. So my questions for, for, for North Korea is, why have you lasted so long as a totalitarian state? In fact, uniquely, there's nothing comparable in world history for a state like North Korea to last so long. And just compare it to some of the other uh, totalitarian states we've known and, and suffered from. Um, and North Korea's been there twice as long with no sign that it's going to go anywhere soon. Why is that? <clears throat> when a great leader dies in, in, in these kind of states, the state usually dies too. Nazi Germany ended with Hitler. Uh, Stalin died and the gulag melted away in two or three years. Ma Mao died and China became a fundamentally different country. It became the country we know now, which is a sort of a top-down uh, capitalism that sells its stuff. Um, where I'm pointing, ah, there, I'm po pointing in the right direction. But North Korea is a, a big exception to that rule. It's had two leaders die with no change. Uh, they're all in the same family, but fundamentally, North Korea operates as it did in the <coughs> 1950s. And why? That's that's what this book deals with. It's um, you know, it's a political science question. 
political science questions are uh, interesting, but not particularly entertaining to read. And so what, I tr what I've tried to do in this book is to set up uh, a conflict uh, character study between this guy, Kim Il-sung, the great leader, um, who is the person who invented North Korea and is in some ways a kind of clockmaker god in that he invented a country and stopped time. North Korea runs and exists pretty much in the time space that he invented in the 1950s. I think that's a good way to understand why it is so resistant to change. And then the adventure story of Ken Rowe and how he managed to electrify the world in 1953 by taking a Soviet-made MiG and landing it at a U.S. Air Force base in South Korea. The book moves back and forth between the characters of these two men who have much different goals. Uh, and in the end, uh, Kim Il-sung survives and, and Ken Rowe comes to the United States. But who is Kim Il-sung? Uh, I think it's very important to understand the contemporary behavior of North Korea to understand a bit about his background in history. Um, he left North Korea when he was seven years old and went to live in China. Uh, the entire region, all of the Korean Peninsula and Northeast China called Manchuria then, was ruled by the Japanese, Japanese occupation, which was onerous, which denied Koreans their, their nationality, their language, their names at, at one point. Um, and he became, at a very young age, he became a, uh, a communist, and he became an anti-Japanese uh, activist, and then he became a guerrilla leader. He was really good at it. He, he was bright, he was brave, he was resourceful, he was ruthless. Um, and by the time he was in his early 20s, he was a legend across the Korean Peninsula because he had the courage and the ability to lead small groups of other Korean guerrillas to attack Japanese garrisons inside Korea and kill Japanese. Uh, and his name became well known. What the Korean people didn't know was that he was still a really young guy. Um, the raids infuriated the Japanese and they exterminated his guerrilla operation. Killed virtually everyone except for him and a handful of other people. And he escaped uh, from Manchuria to the Soviet Far East and went to live in a uh, Soviet military base where he uh, uh, got married, uh, had his first son, and that little cute guy grew up to be the dear leader, Kim Il-sung, I mean Kim Jong-il, sorry. Um, but at the same time, he became a... a uh, a fairly reliable soldier, uh, a captain in the uh, Soviet army. And when the war ended in 1945 and the Korean uh, Peninsula was divided, half for the Americans, half for the Soviet Union, the Soviets moved in and took over and set up a government. But they needed somebody <laughs> who they thought would be pliable, uh, who was a communist, who would help them uh, take control of the country. And because his name was well known, he was a legend, uh, they chose him to be their puppet. He turned out to be much more than a puppet. When he came to, to, to North Korea, in a very short time, he consolidated police power. He, he sent his comrades out to be the heads of the various police units all across uh, North Korea. And he worked very closely with the Soviet leadership and with Stalin. And what's really important is that he managed to persuade Stalin over a course of about a year and a half that it would be a good move to invade South Korea and to unite the entire Korean Peninsula as a communist uh, country. In 1950, he, he started the war with Stalin's support and with Stalin's tanks and uh, guns. And for uh, a few weeks, he was a genius. He, he managed to smash the South Koreans, 
move and, and occupy most of the country. The Americans had withdrawn most of their military forces by that point, and it was a relatively easy military move. But Kim Il-sung, for um, all of his uh, political skills, was a rotten general. And in a very short time, his, his lines were overextended, and he was in trouble. And he was defeated militarily by the Americans. And in the course of defeating Kim Il-sung, the Americans brought in their big planes, the B-29s. These are the planes that, that firebombed Tokyo. And for the next three years, the Americans, in response to the aggression from the north, they bombed the living daylight out of North Korea. They destroyed, by one Russian estimate, 85% of all the structures in North Korea. The, the, the severity of the destruction is almost unimaginable. And in the words of, of two fairly important Americans, um, we knocked almost every brick off every other brick in the country. And Curtis LeMay estimated that we killed 20% of the population. Um, to get a sense of what happened to North Korea during that war, 10% um, uh, of the population, uh, nearly 20% was killed. And if, that, if, we had, if the North Koreans had done to us what we did to them, with the population of the United States in 1950, it would have killed 30 million Americans. So this bombing is very important to understand, and I think it's one of the most important parts of the book, because the bombing as a narrative of the war has not re was not really reported at the time, and it's not a big part of the histories of the Korean War. But for the Kore North Korean people, it's incredibly important because the Kim dynasty keeps reminding them, this is what the Americans did to you. <clears throat> and in contemporary North Korea, where it's poor, it's dark, there's not much electricity, and it's isolated, and people know how poor they are in relation to the rest of the world because of uh, the... Uh, uh, prevalence of radios and DVDs now in North Korea, the one thing that the Kim family can continue to remind people is the Americans did this to you and to grandma. They killed your grandma. And unless we <laughs> spend all our money on arms and on a ferocious military, the Americans might come back and do it again. And it's a, it's a narrative because it's based in fact that has... Uh, the ring of truth, and gives the government what legitimacy it has outside of the um, uh, repression that it imposes. So that's, that's sort of the political science uh, uh, lesson of the book. And let's get to the adventure story. Um, the man on the tricycle, the boy on the tricycle, is the man sitting in this chair. Um, Ken Rowe whose name at that time was No Komsok, he grew up in a relatively privileged situation in North Korea. His father worked for a major Japanese company, a big conglomerate. And his father had regular income. The family had enough money to buy a Japanese tricycle. Uh, his father played baseball and was a very good pitcher. Um, American imperialist game. Uh, his father bought Japanese picture books that had pictures and stories about the good life in the, in the United States, which young Nokomsuk read. Um, his mother wore furs, pretty unusual. And in this picture, he wore fur, which is <laughs> probably even more unusual. Um, but after the Russians uh, came into Korea in 1945, his father got sick and died. He lost his job, got sick and died. Um, the family went from being middle class to being poor. Ken had to figure out a way to survive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but one of the things he did is he, he became the youngest fighter pilot in the North Korean Air Force, which is quite a trick. He became an expert flying this MiG-15, and he flew 100 missions against the Americans during the Korean War, trying not to shoot them down and trying not to get killed. 
because he planned to go to the United States. And when he landed, it's almost impossible to overstate what a big deal it was, not just in Korea, but around the world. This is the headline, the day he landed in the Washington Post. Now that's the kind of headline you get when a war ends. Um, but it was a truly momentous occasion because it, it, it broke a lot of the information about how the Korean War was conducted and Stalin's involvement by having Russians training people like Ken to fly the MiGs. Um, when he landed, these were the, this was the word that he knew in English. And he asked basically to be taken to his leader, to their, to their, to take me to your, your leader by motor car. Um, uh, this picture is out of sequence, so I'll forget it. Uh, when his plane landed, the first person they called, or maybe the second person they called to come check out the airplane, was the most famous test pilot in the world, Chuck Yeager, who met Ken. And Ken told him not to go up there and uh, told him how not to uh, crash the plane. He also came back and met, became close friends with Richard Nixon. Um, got married, had a family, had a huge career uh, all over the United States working for aerospace companies, and is now retired and living in, in Daytona Beach, where this picture was taken uh, last year. He took that picture. Yeah, thank you. I don't like that picture. <laughs> you don't like that picture? I like it. All right, so enough of me talking. Um, Ken, let me ask you, why did you dislike the great leader so much that you were willing to risk your life to get away from him? I hated the Soviet communism, and they set up the North Korean puppet regime. And then, of course, uh, what he did, he started, uh, started building up the dictatorial government and gradually taking away the freedom and the uh, and then just double talking. This is the other democratic country. Absolutely not. That's not democratic country. They have freedom of uh, expression, no freedom of expression. Freedom of religion, that was ab absolutely false. So gradually I got uh, upset. On the other hand, uh, you look at South Korea, that's really a communist country they are building. Freedom and all things are going. So I hated Kim Il sung more than ever. And only way to get even was uh, I have to get out of there. I cannot overthrow the North Korean government. So I was young. Nin 1945, when he sh Kim Il-sung showed up, I was 13. 13 year old uh, anti commerce That was I, I was. In my heart, I want to escape someday and go to the U.S. somehow. Well, how did you decide to pretend to be a number one communist? You well, see, that's uh, my feeling. I just feel that uh, I hate it so much that uh, nobody hates the communism more than me. But I hide it behind me. So I thought that uh, which, wherever I was, in group or schools or classes, I thought I'm more anti-communist than everybody, anybody. That's why I believed in myself. So my goal was uh, someday I want to leave there and go to South Korea when I become a little bit older. At 13 years old, I cannot go any place. I cannot make a living with my, myself. So I waited, waited, and went to school, and that made me more angry because they started indoctrinating the students. You know, they start bringing the communist instructors, and uh, they teach the communist theory. In fact, the Soviet uh, party history they were teaching. Of course, I have to study that so that I have to pass. I cannot flunk those. So I passed all of them by lying. But because, because I was not happy. And that's 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. When I became 17, I was getting a little bigger. And uh, just for time to get a higher education. How do I take a high, higher education? Go to the university or college someplace. There is one university in North Korea, Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. I knew I cannot go there. They uh, admitted the only students with the communist background, such as father is in an important position in the North Korean government. So I gave up. 
So I thought, what do I do? So one day I saw the bulletin board in the city said that we are recruiting the Naval Academy cadets. I know what the Naval Academy was. That's like a Navy college or university. You get a college education plus propaganda, military, I mean the uh, communist theory, they brainwash more. And then uh, how, the other thing they teach. So I thought that uh, why not I go there and get the free uh, education, even though I'm not a communist. I had a second thought. Since I'm a number one anti-communist, should I go there? That's a rough place. But then that's better than not going to college at all. So I volunteered and took the exam. My goal, my uh, aim was that uh, after I graduated from Naval Academy, when I become a Naval officer, I wanted to escape by patrol boat if I have a chance to ride around the patrol boat. That was my aim was at that time. Well, how did you get from being in the Navy to being in the Air Force? Yeah, after war started, after war started, everything was bombed out. Our campus, Naval Academy was gone. We were in, living in a railroad tunnel, half-finished railroad tunnel, because the Americans keep dropping the bombs. <laughs> and then I, uh, that was my barracks and uh, piled up the sandbags in both ends of the railroad. I thought that's a terrible place near the uh, sea and the, near the Russian border. And then uh, I thought that in my mind, uh, lay down one night, I pondered uh, what a miserable life I'm having. I want to go to the U.S. someday. Now I have to forget about that. Number one, I have to survive this war so that I do the next step. Then the U.S. landed on Incheon, and then they started moving fast. I knew that they they lose the war. And then Navy doctors came one morning, gave a physical exam to the cadets. I knew right away type of test they are giving. They are sending naval cadets to become a pilot. You know, physical exam, we are all healthy. There's no reason to take a physical exam. And they're having spinning tests with a holding ear and turn around. I saw a couple of guys who fell down on the ground. So I know they're uh, rejected. The guy who was recording the test score was a Communist Party, I mean, Russian Bolshevik Party history professor. And that's a very important Communist uh, course. And I got an A. They said that if we get an A on that course, he's a real Communist. I got an A, and I was more, than, more anti-Communist than ever in my mind. So I want to, someday I want to destroy them. So I, I was getting along with him so well, so I saw that him, I was standing near him. I said, uh, comrade, the professor, could I take that test? And he hesitated a couple of seconds. Said, okay, go ahead, Ted, take. So I took that test. You know, spinning things, I have no problem. When I was a kid, I used to play around in, with other kids. Then I passed. The spinning test was you put your hand on the ground and you run around in circles. Yeah, also like a holding, good yeah, holding this ear here and uh, touch the ground and turn around about 20 times, then stand up straight and walk straight. If somebody yeah. never did that, they fall down. And it turned out when you became a pilot that you could fly upside down and it never <laughs> bothered you. Yeah, of course, I was very good at the acrobatics. Yeah. Not because of that. I was very good at that. But anyway. Well, yeah. So you got into the Air Force. Yeah. Which was the second happiest day of your yeah. life. Yeah. But anyway, you see, why I was at that, when I was, a, I was a, selected and went to the Air Force, that was my second happiest day in my life. Why? Because uh, in order to become a pilot, uh, they have to go out of North Korea. They cannot train North Koreans in North Korea because of the American planes all over. So once I go out of uh, Korea, I will be safe. I don't have to worry about bombs keep coming down from the skies. So I was very happy. And next thing was that uh, in order to become pilots, uh, take at least one year. Now, U.S. Marines landed on the shore of Incheon, moving very fast. So, and then news blacked out. I don't know where they were. They were probably already going towards the north, to the 38th parallel. So I know that the uh, war will be over, you know, by, by the time I become a pilot. So I don't have to fight the war. So I will be safe. 
then that next thing would be, what if North Korea loses the war? We might end up with becoming a pirates, a North Korean pirates in exile, either in China or Russia. However, since I'm a pilot, I can always escape. So I was so jubilant. Yeah. Of course, I cannot express my feeling. I get into trouble. So inside me, I was happy. That was exactly true, what I predicted. Train we took at night, went and crossed the Chinese border and went to the Chinese Manchuria. And that's where all North Korea was rebuilding the Air Force. So why they recruited Naval Academy cadets for the uh, flight training was that uh, the November 1950, Chinese army entered the war, and the Russians, you know, they were cowards. They don't want to get involved in the war. However, however because Chinese got in, they have to do something, and Chinese forced them to do something to uh, protect us from the air. So a Russian pilot entered the war in November 1950. They were not well trained. Of course, when they f started flying, what they did was the plane was uh, marked with Chinese and North Koreans, and they were not to speak Russian in the air. They were supposed to speak Chinese or Korean. In you know, Russia, the, they read not to say anything in the air. When they got into trouble, they started talking in Russian. So America knew that the Russians were flying. But officially, so, no one talked about it. Uh, the American pilots all knew that the Russians yeah. were flying the planes. Yeah. Um, uh, Stalin knew that the, Truman knew, and yeah. Truman knew that Stalin knew. Yeah, they knew. But they never talked about it because they didn't want the war, they didn't want the bloodshed to escalate into right. World War III. Right. So all the killing was combined right. to the Korean Peninsula. Right. So that the Russians, uh, what they did was uh, they want to train the Chinese and North Korean as soon as possible so they let them to fly and use a radio in the air, in Korean language, Chinese language, so that they can say that the North Korea and the Chinese are fighting now. That's their aim was. That's what we went to China. They were in a rush and trained us to fly the plane, and then we took the jet training. You said that one of the best things about the war for yes. you was yeah. the food. Oh, yeah. They... Once we started flying the jet planes, the food was excellent. Very why excellent. was why was the food so good? You know, they uh, we we were at the same mess hall as the Russian pilots. The Russians believe that they must eat good food so that they are strong and not get dizzy. So they brought the best cooks from the international hotels in Shanghai. They brought them to the airport. They cooked. And what did you eat? Oh, their food was just fantastic. Yeah, not pure Chinese or not pure Russian, some kind of between that, and that was tasty. So I was looking forward to every evening to eat the food. <laughs> did, you, did you develop a taste for vodka and for blinis? Yeah, you know, also, also when I entered the war, they gave a 100 gram of a vodka or cognac so that the pilot can sleep well. But you see, Russians, 100 grand means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so Russians got the more money, more salary than the North Korean or Chinese. I think they got at least, uh, at least three times more, and they got the more freedom. North Korea cannot get, go out of the car, uh, base. And Ch Russians had the freedom, so they asked their truck driver, to, hey, take us to the store outside the base. So they go out and buy vodka and bring back in the base. And they bring that into the uh, dining room. You know, they're hiding here. And then under the table, they uh, give everybody drinking. So we used to sit nearby Russians. But they were very <laughs> generous. They gave me vodka. Then I said uh, in Russian language, spasibo. <laughs> that was thank you. Yeah, I had free drinks. Yeah. I had plenty of drinks. At first, I got in trouble because uh, I almost lost my mind. Because that was so, so strong. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, one guy told me that uh, I drink that much on top. And you, oh, I asked me to drink that much. He will finish up. I thought, he's crazy. I can drink more than this. So I drink a little bit more than that. My goodness. That, I got out of my mind. Right. <laughs> right. Then on, I was very careful. But you did learn how to fly the MiG. And I want oh, yeah. to ask you about, you flew along with several of your comrades, North Korean comrades, you yes. flew your MiGs into North Korea yes. to present the MiGs for inspection by the great leader. 
Oh, yes. And there was a day when you saw yeah. him with yes. his son, yes. Kim Jong-il. Yes. And when you thought of perhaps shooting your great yeah. leader. You're right. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. We, we, uh, uh, just before we went to, into the combat mission, Kim Il-sung knew that the North Korean's first fighter squadron was ready for combat. So he wanted to see them, the airplane and the pilots. So eight of us flew from Chinese air base and uh, uh, landed in the North Korean soil, which was Uizu. Uizu is just outside of the Yaro River. So we went there, and Kim Il-sung came over there. And we got off and uh, lined up an airplane, and uh, we pilots stood up uh, line, and we watched what's going on. Then Kim Il-sung was inspecting the plane. And, uh, you know, I thought that uh, since I'm a number one anti-communist, I could kill because I have a automatic pistol in my waist. I can eat in my mind. But then, you see, if I kill, I have to die. I thought, that why not I just live and do more damage to him than just kill him and I die. So I gave up, finally. But I watched what he was doing. He was making a, in a statement that the, looking at the MiG cannon, he said, oh, gee, with this cannon like this, he can't even kill the American granddaddies. That's what he said. And he asked uh, that the, his son, that the, would you like to play, fly a plane like this? And he said, the yeah, young boy said uh, yes. By the way, the young boy was uh, Kim Jong Kim Jong Il. He's ten years younger than me. And he said yes. So Kim Il Sung told his son that uh, in order to play, fly a plane like this, you got to study hard. <laughs> that's what he told his son. Well, then after that, he just suddenly disappeared because that's dangerous. You know, any time uh, American plane might come and scrape there. So we went back to China after that. So I didn't shoot him. I could have shot him, but then I have to die. In my mind, I want to live as long as I can, and I want to give more damage to North Korea than anybody did. Let me ask you about your experience in fighting against the American yeah. saber jets. Yes. Um, you flew more than 100 missions, yes. combat missions, yes. during the Korean War. Yeah. And on many of those missions, you would, would encounter yeah. American fighter jets. Yes. And they were in the business of trying to kill you. Right. And you were supposed to be in the business of trying to kill them. Right. Did you ever shoot down an American plane? Yeah, I have not. Uh, uh, of course, I was not anxious to shoot them down. In my mind, uh, I want to survive and go to the U.S. someday. So, you know, my main... Uh, main thought was that uh, I don't want to be killed by them, and I was not anxious to shoot them. But if an uh, opportunity comes, I have to fire, otherwise I get into trouble. So I went out to the combat mission. By the way, we were not well trained, you know, very poorly trained. I wrote, told the Russian instructor that uh, we are not ready. He said, what do you mean we are not ready? You, you can go on the fight. He told me that uh, he got a much less flying hours than me and went fought against the German Air Force. You know, German Air Force near the end of the war, they didn't have any, any time to be trained. So the untrained pilots versus untrained pilots fought in the war in Europe. But I told him that Americans flew more than 1,000 hours. Then I stopped talking to him. I might get into trouble. I told him because he's Russian. I cannot tell the North Koreans that, uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, with the Russians, uh, I could talk about almost everything. By the way, Russians are more easygoing than North Koreans. I hated these North Koreans. Chinese were more easygoing. And Russians uh, jokes a lot. Well, why were the North Koreans so uh, difficult as, as comrades? Is it because they were afraid of punishment? Yeah, they, they were watching uh, the guarding against each other. And uh, as soon as they find out some fault, they report to the party. Party boss. So Were you under pressure trouble. to report people? Oh, yeah. Once you hear something, uh, then uh, they, I have to report. If I don't report, I get into trouble. Right. Yeah. Like uh, that uh, one guy in the Air Force uh, who, didn't, who was rejected after proper plane training. He couldn't take uh, jet training because his background was suspicious. And he told them other pilots who didn't go to the big training, he said that, uh, yeah, I'm mad at the North Korean Air Force. They want to train us to fly slow propeller planes 
and fight against the American jets. He said uh, he wanted to escape to South Korea. Somebody heard that and reported to that, to the North Korean Air Force, that he got executed because of that. Let me ask you, you had this long-term desire yes. to defect. Yes. And, but you knew that if you did succeed yes. in taking a MiG, yes. a prize MiG away from the, dear, the great leader, right. um, that the people around you yes. would be punished and perhaps killed. I knew that something would happen, especially my best friend from Naval Academy. I know he would be hurt. But then uh, what do I do? I want to go, and I waited. I was patient. And, of course, I cannot escape at any time. I get killed. So waited and waited. Then finally, the war was over. I decided that uh, my chance of success is about only 20%. 80% of the time, I might be killed. But then I decided, okay, I'm ready to die in case I fail. I cannot have a limit there. I have no stomach limit in North Korea. Every day goes by, I hate it then. So... After ceasefire, we went to North Korea and uh, moving toward the southern part of the airport, newly uh, repaired the airport. I was thinking that escape is so much that uh, I dreamed of my escape. In dream, I succeeded. In dream, I landed that I was in New York City. Yeah, this is New York City, right? Yeah, I was, in, yeah, I was in standing in front of the Empire State Building. I look at there, oh my goodness, that's tall and half was covered by the, the cloud. The people ask you, how do you know Empire State Building? I had an English textbook in North Korea, and that had the Empire Building, State Building was there. The English textbook was uh, published by Japanese, uh, Japanese. So that's why I know how Empire State Building looks. But for someone leaving a country like North Korea, there is no clean escape. You knew that yeah. if you pursued your dream that somebody was going to die. Yeah, I know, yes. So uh, my best friend uh, definitely was executed, plus four others. Altogether, five pilots were in my unit and were executed by firing squad. I know one is my best friend, no question about that. The other four, I think they are not really uh, anti-communist. They just didn't know my thinking. So that's the crime was that uh, why you didn't know a guy like that was in your unit uh, throughout the war, you should have known. So they were executed. The context for um, the anger that his defection created in the top leadership was on mm. the day that he defected, um, that night in, in Moscow, uh, the great leader, Kim Il-sung, was having a celebratory dinner with... Uh, Stalin's successors. At, by this time, Stalin was dead, and uh, new Soviet uh, leadership were meeting with the great leader and giving him a huge amount of aid and grants to rebuild his country from the American destruction. And that evening, Kim Il-sung probably had the most successful night of fundraising in his life. He got a, a large part of the commitments that helped rebuild the country. And so he went, and he was compared... <clears throat> at that dinner by the by the, 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 the Soviet premier to uh, George Washington and other founding fathers who had fought against colonialism and had won a glorious victory for freedom. And he went to bed um, happily. And then he woke up in the morning to find out that this gentleman had stolen a MiG and landed in uh, Seoul. And the headlines around the world were similar to the ones that I showed you on the screen. Um, I wanted to ask you when you when you landed your plane, Ken, did it? Did you almost collide with an American? Yeah, when I was coming down from North Korea, he said my aim was that uh, I have to come down and uh, land as soon as possible, so that uh, I I give no chance for anybody to shoot at me. You know, someone sees me, they will fire shoot at me. So I was coming down just straight down with a downwind. That means a north wind. I'm not supposed to land with the wind. You must land against the wind. But I cannot go around from the other side to come. Somebody sees me. So I come down there. Then the American plane was flying around in that area. You know, they completely ignored. By the way, why they didn't know I was coming? 
was that radar was shot down at U.S. Kimpo Air Base. You were lucky. Yeah, I was very lucky. That's the luckiest day in my life. That morning, radar was shut down. Without radar, they don't know what's in here. With the radar, they know what's going on in North Korean skies. You know, not like World War I, that they watch the skies with the binoculars. They don't do that. Radars. The radar was shut down. They didn't know. That's when I approached the airport. I saw the American planes. They were flying around slowly. I thought, shit, this is a, either they uh, ignore me or completely relaxed. They didn't see me. That's why I thought that I can land there safely. But then the American plane was landing from the other side. And uh, I thought that he was uh, much higher than me from the other side. He said, I'm close to the runway. So I assumed that he would go over without landing. But he landed. I landed. So we passed uh, on the runway. Narrowly, narrowly uh, avoided the head-on collision. How close do you think? I think that's, uh, you know, so went so fast that uh, I'm just, uh, is, uh, that's what I just went through and uh, I didn't collide. And yeah. that pilot shouted over the radio. The f and it was the first knowledge that uh, the airbase had that there was a, a MiG in the area. He shouted at the top of his lungs, it's a goddamn MiG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, and, MiG and then he got out of his airplane yeah. and, and yeah. hyperventilated for a while. Yeah. Yeah, so you see, we, so after landing, I almost got killed there. And then, then what happened was that I taxied. I cannot stop playing on the runway. Of course, I could have gotten into trouble with my tires also. We had a Chinese made tire. Oh, that was a very bad shape. You know, tread was showing. But then I cannot tell North Korean that they changed the tire so that I can escape. <laughs> 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 so with a bad tire, I uh, landed uh, and I used a lot of brake to slow down. Uh, fortunately, the tire didn't blow, blow up. So I taxied and uh, saw the American planes were lined up there. Okay, I got to park the one of, near them. Them used to be fighting in the air. Now I'm on the ground near them. The pilots were in those uh, American planes. They're sitting in the cockpit on alert. Alert means uh, they sit there waiting for the order so that they start the engine and take off. That's what the alert was. And one fellow at the end of the row, he saw plane was landing from opposite side. He said, that crazy guy, crazy, landing from the other way. should be the other way. And then next thing was he was right, reading the magazine. And next thing was that he was taxing toward the, uh, the uh, taxiway and come toward him. And he noticed that, the, gee, this is an enemy plane. And he was petrified. And he told me that the later that the, he almost pulled the trigger and shoot at me with a machine gun. I don't know whether the machine gun could be fired on the ground. But if he did fire, the, the, I could have killed on the ground the second time. First time collision, second time he's aiming at me and shoot at me. But he didn't shoot at me. So I just went and I just parked beside him. And then there's no other pilots, nobody there. I said, gee, what happened? You know, if I park in North Korea, normally ground crews bring the ladder there so that I can come out. You know, I don't have ladders there. I just opened and I jumped out. You see, I was young at that time. I could do a lot of things. Now I cannot do that. I cannot jump down there. Maybe I'm breaking my legs. Then I walked around the plane. That pilot who almost fired me, he was walking toward me. So we met in between the two planes. So I tried to give him a good will. So I saluted him and we shook hands. That's all I could do. Could he cannot speak Korean? You spoke Russian. Yeah. Japanese and Korean, and yeah. he, of course, only spoke English. Yeah, he spoke English. So those languages were useless. Yeah. So I shook hands. Then within uh, seconds, uh, other pilots came out, about a half dozen. So I shook hands with every one of them. I was impressed by Americans. You know, they were not the air pirates. They're clean cut <laughs> and speaking English to each other. That's the first time I heard that English-speaking people speaking English. Oh. There, there, there was a picture of yeah. someone in your airplane. What, yeah. what, what, whose picture and what did you do with oh, it? Oh, yeah. You know, all the MiGs they had the Kim Il Sung's uh, uh, little picture on the uh, instrument panel. You know, that, that, that North Korean 
commander, he came up with that idea that in order to show the respect for the, our leader, everybody should carry the Kim Il-sung's picture, a small framed picture on an uh, instrument panel. And I hate it whenever I fly. You know, I hate the communism. I hate him. So first thing I did was before I jumped out of the cockpit, I pulled that out. And when I got the ground, ground I smashed that on the ground. I destroyed his fi picture. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were interrogated by the Americans, they kept asking you about the moolah, yeah. about money. And yeah. the context for that is that an offer had been made mm. in the spring of that year called Operation mm. Moolah. They would give $100,000 cash mm. to any red pilot who had the moxie to bring a MiG to an American Air Force base. They dropped leaflets all over North Korea, not over Manchuria, where he was based, uh, to that effect. And they did radio broadcasts in three or four languages saying, come to America, get the money, everything will be great. And they expected some takers. They never got any until Ken showed up. And when he did show up with his MiG, they expected that he had come for the moolah. <laughs> Uh, and they kept asking him about it and making sort of uh, oblique references to, oh, you're a rich man now. One one person told you that you could now afford to buy 30 or 30, 40 cars? 33 brand new cars. Yeah. And he didn't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> it was and they didn't explain what Operation Moolah was or why he was a rich man. Um, and... When did you uh, understand what Operation Moolah was? Well, when I got to the U U.S. Uh, uh, interrogation started, uh, uh, oh, I went to bed. Next morning, I got up, uh, and then somebody brought a South Korean newspaper, threw at me. So I look at there. They talk about the money. They talk about the money. I said, "What is the money?" But I felt good. You know, I didn't have anything at that time. And then somebody turned the radio on, and they talk about me, and they talk about the money, Mula. Uh, then they, all this money keep coming up. I had no idea uh, what that was. Yeah, And it turned out that the day he landed, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was president of the United States, he also learned for the first time about Operation Mula. He, something that he had never approved, but which had been approved by General Clark, the Far East Command, in Tokyo. And Eisenhower didn't like the idea of giving moolah, $100,000 of taxpayer money, to an airplane thief. So he wrote a letter to his staff saying, let's find a way to keep this guy from getting that money and spending it on booze and broads. <laughs> And so they spent the next yeah. seven months, these are the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Army, um, the Secretary of Defense, uh, and all those who worked for them trying to finagle away not to pay him the money that had been promised. At one point, a CIA employee told you that you should go to a press conference and do mm -hmm. what? Yeah, what happened was that uh, the... Uh, when I went to Okinawa from South Korea, the CIA man came to talk to me. He said that, uh, hey, no come, sir, uh, why not tell to the news conference, next news conference, tell them that uh, you don't want the money. However, we give you a new car and uh, whatever you need, and uh, you get some money, monthly money. That's what he told me. I have no choice if he tell me what to say. I have to say, uh, far, obey by his his word, because I have. And you agreed to do that. Yeah, I didn't reject it. I I have no veto power. If he say I have to do that. But the but Americans then, changed their mind. Yeah, but then uh, of course you see, the reporters after keep after the Americans uh, saying that uh, that the money offer was uh, American reneged that promised money, so Americans. Uh, didn't like that the press is keep after saying that kind of thing. So they want to make me to say, I don't want it. But then about two months later, the CIA man came to Okinawa from Japan. And I asked him, when am I going to have a press conference? 
He said, oh, you don't worry about that. They cancel that. You get your money. That's what he told me. Then shortly after that, they gave me a check. And they took me to, uh, to the American Express Bank in the uh, U.S. Air Base in Okinawa. And then I devised the money and, uh, you know, the photog photographers took a picture and put that on the front page of the Star and Stripes uh, uh, newspaper. And then it went all over. I received the money. Well, what money? That was a fake check. They want to calm, calm down the press. That's why they issued the and he, fake he, check. And he did not get the money. Um, and this is the legacy of the letter that Eisenhower wrote the night that he found out about Operation Moolah. He did not get the money, um, really, for 20 years. It was put into a trust fund, and he was told um, that he could, you got access to $5,000 initially. Yeah, when I did receive, after I come to this country, they did give me that money, you know, quietly. And initially, he said, okay, to get started, give this $5,000 deposit to your bank where you are going to live. And the other one, they established the trust fund so that uh, I receive, they invest that money, and they give me a monthly stipend. They, I have to live on that money. That's what they told me. So and, you, I, and you kept it in, in that trust fund for 20 years? Yeah, 20 years. And then you took it out and invested it yourself and right, did better with right. it. Right, right. Initially, I suspected that uh, yeah. why they want to do that. They want to take money away. But later, I realized that uh, that's a good idea. You see, if I have money, what do I do? Yeah. I go out and uh, spend someplace. I also wanted to ask you a question about your first press conference Yes. Uh, in, in Seoul, which occurred the day after he arrived. And there was an enormous press presence <clears throat> in Seoul. It was the sort of the, the, the people who'd been covering the Korean War, which was the biggest story in the world. So there were, there were hundreds of reporters there. Yeah. And yeah. his landing was the big deal. And so the next day they had a press conference. And he, he was planning to go to the United States, the, the land of the free and home of the yeah, brave and yeah. truthful uh, yeah. government. Yeah. And what did the Americans tell you to lie about? Yeah, just before the press conference, Americans told me that, uh, you know, Americans were fighting in the air in Chinese skies. Because I was on the other side, I know. So one fellow came and uh, he asked him, did the American ever fly uh, into the Chinese airspace? I say, yes, I was fighting every day. <laughs> he said that, uh, don't say that uh, in the news conference. He told me. It was American yeah. policy not to allow uh, its warplanes to go into Manchuria on war missions. But in fact, most of the aces, the people who shot down more than five aircraft, uh, they all went into Manchuria and shot down MiGs as they were landing and taking off. And they did this secretly over about a year and a half. Yeah, about half of the Korean War, they went into China. And they, it was never acknowledged by the United States, and it was never publicized by the press. He knew the story because he'd seen these planes shoot down his comrades for a year and a half, yeah. and the first thing the Americans told him to do was to lie about it. And did you do what yeah, they told you? Yeah, yeah I lied. But the, however, well, you know, the communists were lying too. They were lying that the Soviet planes never fought in the Korean War. Oh, that's a big lie. They said they never fought. You know, they fought since 1950 through the end of the war. So they're almost like canceled out. The American <laughs> lied. The Soviet Union lied. So they, don't, they didn't push too hard. They and you'd understood. grown up lying about being a communist, so you <laughs> yeah. were comfortable yeah. doing yeah. what the Americans yeah. told yeah. you to do. Yeah. Also, you see, uh, the Soviet Union said, uh, we never give any weapon to North Koreans. Then how come North Koreans have so much weapons? Well, that's when we were uh, retreating. We were evacuating North Korea in 1948. We left our weapons. Then what about the jet planes? Did, they, did you leave that plane in North Korea in 1940? That's false. That's when the Americans uh, uh, offered them to take that back. We want to give you back the plane. Owners, please claim the plane. Who is the owner? Yeah. North Korea cannot say they owner. Soviet Union said we never give we weapons to North Korea. Where did you get the plane? And Soviet Union saying the same thing. They never give a weapon to North Korea. But how can I then say that the, that's ours? Yeah. So they didn't say anything, nothing. So the plane was unclaimed. So Americans tested the plane and uh, brought back here 
and tested again and again. In fact, the American test pilot flew that plane more than Soviet test pilot. Yeah. And that's uh, now in the Air Force Museum in uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. You can go see the plane. It's on display yeah. in, in Ohio. So let's open this up to any questions you have. Uh, um, <clears throat> raise your hand and ask a question. Are there any questions? Yeah. I, I, we can't hear you. Is there a microphone? Okay. Uh, I am immigrant for 42 years ago from Seoul. Actually, I'm a North Korean too. Uh, the happening 1950 Korean War, we are junior high school. That time, my first, uh, my surprise of then, then after, come down. 1951 come down to Seoul. Uh, that time the Lieutenant No the came down the from first time the when the MIG in the 15 that the first time to hear. I heard for the America's much offering 1.5 million gave it to that's why the 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 Lieutenant pilot come down, that that's why we heard that. The, during that time, Korean War, the America need more eager to half the Soviet, the MIG, the technique, they want to know much offering that. The one is the South Korea, and the other one, the German too. First, we heard Korean paper said, first time, lift Lieutenant No come the to bring the MIG 15. That time, much curious about that. I come down my the fleet about to walk <coughs> how many miles from Pyongyang to Seoul, walking, walking. The same thing like now. Those Korean to flee to flee to Manchu, they come down, come to South Right. Not, only things that time, the small junior high school boy, much curious, what is the major motive of coming down the, the, the time? What was your point for that? Yeah, my motive was that yeah. uh, I was, was an anti-communist, not just any anti-communist. Yeah. Wherever I was, yeah. in my heart, yeah. I was the number one anti-communist. So I want to get out of North Korea somehow. Yeah. That's why when I was in North Korean Naval Academy, yeah. when I become a Navy officer, I wanted to escape by warship. Yeah. But then I went to the Air Force. I th thought that this is a much easier way to escape. I see. So throughout the war, yeah. I was thinking of escaping if I had a chance. I, I was entering the war. Yeah. But at the beginning, I cannot escape because I was not a good pilot. I, I didn't even know what... Airport was in South Korea, and yeah. I cannot land on any airport. Yeah. It has to have enough long runway. Yeah. So I waited and waited, and war was over. Yeah. And war was over. Then I thought that the, I really have a chance. Then they stationed us. We went back to North Korea from China, yeah. and they uh, they repaired the airport one by one run yeah. runway and. Uh, the Sunan Airport was the most southern south in North Korea at that time. Nice. And my squadron, squadron was the most ex experienced combat unit. Mm, nice. So we went there, Sunan Airport, yeah. right next to the Pyongyang. Yeah. And then we went there, and then uh, uh, planes arriving. And we got an order that uh, get combat ready. Mm. In order to be combat ready, we have to fly, fly yeah. a plane. You know, because of their movement, we didn't fly for yeah. a month. So they assembled the plane yeah. when they arrived by the train. Yeah. Then, okay, take off, go up in the air, fly around and land. Then they told me that, okay, Nogum, sir, you are number one to take off. Because I was uh, just about the best pilot in uh, that first squadron. Yeah. That's why I decided that, uh, okay, I go one more to take off. I thought that this is the best opportunity to escape. My 
mind was full of escaping in more all my life. Yeah. So that day I took off and went there. Yeah. Of course, uh, you have to raise the die because there's no guarantee that I can go and safely land. In my mind, I only chance of survival was 20%, 80% yeah. I might die. Yeah. But then I have to prepare to die in right. case I fail. Yeah. So I was ready. I went. And you planned for six years. Yeah, or even, longer. And yeah, it even, took you 17 minutes to make that flight. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I'm the first escapee from North Korea after the ceasefire. Now, about 27,000 North Korean got out of there, the South Korea. I'm the first one because I flew from the air. Question? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I understand you and your mother were separated during the war. Um, how was it that, and later reunited, how was it that your mother learned about you? Yeah, story? you know, when, when I went to the North, North Korean Naval Academy at the age of 17 in 1949, that's already I separated from my mother. So my mother stayed in Hungnam, I went to Naval Academy. Even though I was anti-communist, I went to Naval Academy so that I get the free college education. That's why I went then from there to the Air Force. But my mother stayed in Hungnam. And during the war, you see, UN forces went there. Uh, she was under the UN uh, occupation. Then tried retreating. So retreating, all the neighbors going to south to take a free ride. Then the neighbor asked her that, uh, let's go. They said, where you go? Oh, we want to go to South Korea. She said, I'm not going. Why are you not going? My son is in the North Korean Naval Academy. If I go to South, how can I see him? So my neighbor told her that, uh, yeah, in order to see your son, you must survive first. If you don't, you stay here, this will become bad and ground. Everybody dies. So you go to South Korea and survive. Then someday you might see your son. Then she decided, she heard that that makes sense. She stayed there, she will die anyway. So she said, okay, I'll go. So she got to the harbor and got on the ship. That was the last ship. After she got on the, that ship, then many people cannot go on because they cannot take everybody. That's why she went to South Korea, all the way down south. And then she was uh, thinking of how to see me someday. She went there, by the way, December 1950. And she was in refugee camps here, there. And uh, she was in Tagu when I escaped. And then, she, found about, she found out about you by reading the newspapers. Yeah, actually, she saw on the bulletin board. When, when, you know, her roommate, uh, also from North Korea, she talked about me all the time. She knew my name. And then that uh, my mother's roommate uh, went to downtown and saw the bulletin board, saw there, and that name sounds familiar. So she went back and told my mother that uh, that fellow came from North Korea, sound like your son. So my mother didn't believe that. How could my son come? And he said, how did my son come? He's by airplane. So my mother thought that uh, she may came down from North to South Korea as a passenger because I never flew any plane. <laughs> 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 I didn't know that. Then she went to see the board <laughs> and she saw the picture and then that was me. So she said, oh, that is my son. So she went to the South Korean Army headquarters in the Daegu city at that time and told them that uh, that's my son. Well, then... Radio broadcast guessed that uh, Ken Rose's mother appeared in South Korea. And you heard the radio broadcast in Okinawa? Yeah, no, that's that the uh, man who was taking care of Okinawa English, you see, shortwave radio. He heard and uh, he told me that, hey, no come, sir, your mother shows up in South Korea. And then I knew she, she was in South Korea. So they uh, took me back to South Korea and uh, reunited with her. And also, and, I saw the president sing Man Ri. But you were reunited with your mother on stage as sort of yeah, a press event. Yeah, I was having a news conference again. The middle news conference, they brought her, her there. But I was very, sort of embarrassed. But anyway, what can I do? I was glad to see her. Yeah. They were squeezing the last bit of publicity out of yeah, you and your mother. Out of, yeah, yeah, having you know, a news conference, they, they brought her out. Of course, she could not recognize me. When I went to Naval Academy, I was 17. I was uh, not fully grown, and my hair was short cut. And then by then, she saw me. I was wearing a suit, and the hair was grown. 
And she looked at her. She didn't think that I was her son. <laughs> then she realized that I was her son. Yes. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I actually have uh, two questions. The first time, the first one will be for uh, Ms. Rowe. Uh, if you can give uh, maybe a little uh, description about the life in Pyongyang and North Korea before 1948, ever since Kim Il-sung established the uh, communist states, mm. we do not have any information uh, in depth about the pre-communist era uh, 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 of the, the country. I mean, if you can mm. give a little bit of information regarding how was it, was it really a communist Japanese-oriented uh, uh, sorry, capitalist Japanese oriented economy. And the second question uh, today for this generation of North Korean, I know that there is only 150 uh, defectors from North Korea that are in the United States, according to the US CIS uh, stats. I want to know if it is really hard. Is South Korea a mandatory bridge? This, this question actually is for Mr. Harden, maybe. Uh, if, if, if South Korea is a mandatory bridge, for the North Korean to get here, especially that it's a tiny number, or the Swedish embassy in Pyongyang that represents the United States, or the UK that has a representation in Pyongyang, are alternative ways for North Korean to get to the United States. Thank you. The life in North Korea after the World War II was over, the Red Army came. You know, they have done nothing to North Korean economy. And the North Korean economy was deteriorating and then they tried to copy the Soviet system. In the Soviet Union, they had a revolution in 1917. February 1917, they toppled their czar, and they established the democratic government. And the October Revolution, Bolsheviks took over. And then they communized. What's communized? No capitalistic incentives. Killed all the... Uh, private business. And North Korea was copying that. So North Korea, the Red Army came, little business were disappearing one by one. No consumer product uh, productions. And then everything was short. short. So the people were uh, living poor. And we were already living poor during the World War II on the Japanese uh, uh, era. And then after World War II, gradually getting worse and worse. So Food was shortage, short, no necessities, no conveniences. For instance, you cannot buy the toothbrush and toothpaste because they don't produce anything. And then they look at South Korea, they are having a capitalistic uh, enterprise getting better. So North Korea was getting worse and worse. And uh, in my family, of course, my father was deceased and nobody was earning income except uh, I got some money from the uh, chemical college I attended. They give some money, so I give that to my mother. And we just barely survived. The living was so harsh. And like shoes, I never bought a single pair of shoes from 1945 to uh, 1949 until I went to Naval Academy. Or I had the old ones I was wearing. Clothing, same thing, never bought the new clothing. All the old ones are wearing socks, same. So everybody's living so poorly. So, you know, many North Koreans uh, crossed the border and went to South Korea. That was easy beginning of the, uh, after 1945, they could cross. The crash, that was getting harder and harder. And uh, by 1946, and harder. 1947, you have to hire the, hire the, guide at the 38th parallel to cross. Otherwise, you get uh, arrested. Then, North Korean guards started shooting at them in the, 40, the latter part of 47. And 48, North Koreans uh, sent the, the People's Army near the border. Then it's almost impossible to cross. 49 cannot cross the border anymore. So they blocked and people cannot go free that the South Korea and stuff suffered there. In the meantime, North Korea, you know, no freedom. They say that they're a democratic country. And there's no democratic election. Kim il was elected, one person was elected 100%. Nobody, no second person run. 
and they have a freedom of expression. You say something against them, get into big trouble right away. Reli- religious freedom, you go to church, he cannot join the workers' party. If you don't join the workers' party, you don't have any future in North Korea. And, and uh, everything else, and, and the freedom of travel, many parts of North Korea, you have to travel by train. You cannot ride a train without any business. So I cannot just ride a train and I want to go to my relatives. They're not allowed. So we cannot travel. Yeah. That's for the situation was. For your other question, I, I think it's an interesting question why there are so few North Korean defectors living in the United States because Congress passed a special law that makes it relatively <clears throat> straightforward for them to come here and move uh, sort of on a fast track towards citizenship. But I think some of the reasons why there are 28,000, about 28,000 North Korean defectors in South Korea and just a handful in the United States is because South Korea has done a very good job of embracing defectors, giving them support. They, they all go through an education process that includes you know, how to ride a subway, how to, be, how to uh, go, go to the movies, uh, how to uh, um, negotiate a modern society. Uh, and it gives them psychiatric uh, evaluations, gives them dental care. Uh, and this lasts for between eight and 12 weeks or even longer, depending on their needs. And then people are given a stipend for uh, a year and a half or two years. It's changed over the years, but it's, a, it's a, quite a good introduction to life in South Korea. Um, and because the people who come are not like Ken, they're not technocrats, they're not pilots. They tend to be traders who live on the periphery of the country, who are relatively low status, low education, and who would struggle with another language. Um, <clears throat> they stay in South Korea because of the language, and it's it's easier, and because the government makes it possible for them to be there. Coming mm. to the United States, while while legally possible, is culturally and practically an enormous hurdle, and I think that explains the numbers. But still, the numbers seem a bit small, uh, given that they could come. Yeah, I don't. I see the problem with the North Koreans. You know, when they go come down from North Korea to South Korea they'll have a lot of troubles. Number one, North Korea has abolished the Chinese characters. So North Korea doesn't know anything about Chinese characters. That's a handicap. Number two, they don't know anything about the English. In 1948, I was studying English at the school. That's it. They replaced with the Russian. So they know nothing about English. You know, if you don't know the English and you don't know Chinese character, and also language is slightly different, they come down to South Korea, they are handicapped already. So they have to really learn. And educationally, they, yeah. they are more yeah. than handicapped. <clears throat> they're, they're crippled because South Korea exists at the very cutting edge of technology. Um, you know, the, the penetration of smartphones and a wired society is, is, pr- is greater there than just about any country in the world. And in a sense, the North Koreans are coming from another century. Yes. Uh, truly uh, truly a, a remarkable story. Um, I have a two-part question. One, have you been back to South Korea? And if you have, yes. your impressions. And the second part of it is, is if, if you look at North Korea today, is there anything, anything that's fundamentally different or lead you to believe that there is some type of change uh, coming down the pipeline at some point in the future? Uh, let's see. First question was that... Uh, how, well, how many times have you been back oh, yeah. to South Korea? First visit I had was... Uh, I came to this country in 54. 53, I escaped in went to Okinawa and stayed there for seven months. I worked for the U.S. government to provide the information as an employee of the U.S. government. So I came over here in 1954. The first visit I had was uh, in 1970. 1970 I had the first visit. At that time, Korea was started building. But it looks good. 
yeah, I like beef. And then in 1970 to 1979, I had over half dozen visits. Every time I went there, keep changing. And then after 79, I didn't go back. I was so busy doing my own uh, work and trying to make some money here, investing. <laughs> Uh, that's the second question is what? Uh, Do you think North Korea can change? Oh, yeah. You know, you know that I don't think they change because, uh, you know, they kept their old system and uh, they report uh, suspicious people. That's why during the Korean War, when they dropped the spies, they all got caught. Same thing if you, North Koreans uh, start talking about something, then they report, then they get into trouble. So uh, there's no freedom. And uh, the gathering, they say the freedom of gathering, that's not a gathering, except the Communist Party gatherings. And then also the Communist uh, uh, network uh, all the way to the bottom, then they start reporting if somebody's suspicious. So they don't speak out. So I have some thoughts about possibility of change. I, I, I think that it's, uh, it's very early in Kim Jong-un's reign uh, to figure out what's going on. He's been in power for three years and a few months. Um, in some ways, he's more repressive than his father. The border with China has been, it used to be semi-permeable, more permeable than semi. Now it's almost impermeable unless you have permission. Uh, that's a big change because that permeable border had really brought a tremendous amount of commerce and information into North Korea starting in the late 1990s through the death of, of Kim Jong-il in 2011. So that information was a source of potential change because people knew where they were in, con in comparison to the rest of the region and the rest of the world. Uh, but he's closed off that border. Uh, the camps, some of the, the camps, Camp 14, for example, has had new construction. Uh, satellite images show that there's new construction in that camp. Some other camps have been closed, but it's clear that the camps remain an integral part of the repression system. And um, that's very important to know because <coughs> closing that camps, closing the camps would mean fundamental change, and that doesn't seem to be happening. But then on the other side, there does seem to be some pretty strong evidence of change in agriculture. North Korea has what is called a food problem, which means they can't feed a third of their population regularly, and they need either food aid or buy it from abroad. And in the past year and a half or so, there, the Economist had a story just last week that farmers are able to grow food for themselves and sell it on a much, much more uh, consistent basis than had been possible previously. Reforms that had been advocated for decades finally seem to be, seem to be going forward. And there's also uh, a, a really big increase in mining. North Korea sits on top of more than a trillion dollars, more than a trillion dollars worth of rare earth metal. Uh, and the Ch Chinese uh, is the only country in the world that has more, but they have the expertise in mining it. And in recent years, Chinese companies have been able to operate slightly more efficiently in North Korea, going after valuable metals, uh, val valuable minerals. And so there's growth there. If Kim Jong-un gains confidence, he may expand those reforms. And the biggest human, human rights problem in North Korea is not the camps, it's hunger. Because such a large percentage of the population is chronically malnourished. If he could, uh, expand the farm room forms, it would have a big effect on that horrible problem. So it's not completely hopeless, but it's still as repressive as it's ever been. Yes. Uh, I'm a uh, Korean born but American raised 21 uh, year old college student. And the only direct stories that I get about North Korea is from my grandfather who was born in Kaesong and fled to the South in, when the war started. Um, in my generation, like even in Korea right now, we talk a lot about unification and is that possible? Should we do it? And um, I think in the older generation in Korea, there is a sense of we kind of have, we should do it and we have to do it. But 
in my generation, in the 20s and the early 30s, uh, we've we've never experienced life with North Korea, and it's been almost more than 50, 60 years. So we don't. Um, a lot of ki uh, a lot of people in my generation don't think of unification as a necessity. Um, may maybe cause some more troubles economically, socially. So I wanted to hear maybe from both of you about what your thoughts on the prospects of unification and what kind of consequences that might bring. Yeah, what I can say is that uh, unification is needed because, uh, you know, Korea is a small country divided in half. Uh, of course, North Korea is very backward now, but it takes time to revitalize and uh, invest there and uh, change things and educate more people. And eventually they become a, a prosperous country like South Korea if they can you know, unify. But the problem is how to get it unified. <laughs> That's a big problem. Yeah, yeah it, it costs some money, no question about that. But you know, North Korea is a beautiful place, that country. They can build a lot of things and the resources and, uh, and the very scenic places. Because I grew up in North Korea and I still believe that North Korea and the eastern shore is so beautiful. I was riding a train in North Korea when I was young. I enjoyed watching mountain on one side, the other side the ocean. In fact, when I went to Naval Academy in uh, Chongjin, north of there, some Koreans came from the uh, western part of North Korea came and uh, he said, oh, this is a beautiful place. They never saw ocean that beautiful. He said, how come these mountains here and the ocean is here? <laughs> because they never, saw, never saw that kind of place. But I think North Korea will have uh, many things to offer if unified. You know, it is the big question. How long can a totalitarian regime last? Uh, who would predict? In fact, there have been a number of books written uh, over the previous decades called The Death of North Korea, um, predicting that the demise was imminent. Um, it, it just seems to be a fool's game to make a prediction. It could be over like Ceausescu's Romania was over in a week. Um, it could last another 20 years. It, it depends on China. It depends on uh, the potential for a coup in, in Pyongyang. Who knows? I mean, I don't think anybody knows. Um, okay. Are we done? I think we're okay. done. Thank you both Thank you. so much. Thank you. Yeah.